Okay, then uh, if we're happy enough, I can crack on. So first, just a quick thank you as well again to the to Thao, Dan, and and Gerardo for organising things, um, and also to 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 Michael for the nice introduction already. So I think it's very fitting that the topic is quantum Darwinism. There will be some redundancy in the first couple of slides uh, as I cover some of the same introductory things. I think that's that's that, that, that's fair. Um, so yeah, quantum Darwinism is something I started working on over the last couple of years, uh, mostly while I was in Milan, and I started looking at it from a particular set of tools, uh, these things called collision models, which once I introduce them, I think, uh, I'll, hopefully you'll agree, they're kind of almost tailor built for exploring this, uh, this informational or <clears throat> this Darwinistic paradigm. So I guess I kind of have two, two main goals here is just one is just to sort of in, uh, recap a little bit what Michael was saying and cover a little bit of what we've been doing in terms of how the specific details of the interactions and what happens whenever we take, uh, take a single system and make it a little bit more complicated. If I have like a bipartite system, do I still get a, no a proper notion of classicality and objectivity there? But also just to very quickly, if anyone's not familiar with uh, collision models, just introduce you to the, the wonderful world of them. Uh, they're a great tool for playing about. So let me uh, crack in. So as the promised redundancy, we start with a, a slight variation on, on the image that, that Michael was showing. Um, I mean, it's, so I mean, it kind of captures the essence of a lot of what the decoherence framework has been doing. Like uh, if we look at all of the work for a lot of the work of Wojciech and, 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 and others, Decoherence tries to explain, well, why does, how, like, how does classicality emerge? So, you know, this, this nice picture, if we go back to the arguments of, I guess, of Bohr, used to sort of just draw a strict line and say, no, anything that does measurements, say, my apparatus is, lives in the classical world, and then everything that I'm measuring, these small systems, electrons, atoms, um, these are the quantum things, and never the two, uh, the, um, they live in, in distinct regions. But if you look at all the experiments that we've been doing over over the more recent dec uh, recent years, I mean, we're increasingly putting larger and larger things into superposition. And there is, in essence, there's no reason that there should be any strict boundary and we've never been able to see one. So what I think, while decoherence theory gives us a, a good description of why, uh, how, a, how a quantum system loses its, its, its quantum properties, um, I think what Darwinism tries to get at is to say, well, if there is no strict boundary for where I should draw the line between quantum and classical systems, I should have classicality emerging um, from the basic rules of quantum mechanics. And that's really where, where I find that where Darwinism basically comes in. So if you're if you're really interested, if you haven't really dug into the situation into the into the area much, I recommend you go and take a look at this uh, this progress article from from Wojciech, which basically it, it's a perfect introduction to everything to do with to do with Darwinism. And really, I think as was as was said before, I mean the 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 sort of key insight or the key, the key change that that Darwinism does beyond the the uh, standard decoherence framework is it elevates the role of the of the environment so in normal decoherence when we take a system and we plug it we say okay it's it's being affected by a bath in some way that's destroying its inherent quantum properties um, we normally find a way to write down an effective dynamics that takes into account the environment's effects without having to keep track of it so then that's where we get our master equations or, or whatever whatever your favorite open systems tools is but what, what Darwinism then says is that, well, no, actually, the, the way in which we, we access information about a system is through the environment. And so I think you know, there's this very nice section uh, in the early part of this, in this, in this article where it kind of just lays out the intuition or the motivations for it. And so it says, you know, like the decoherence theory is, is extremely useful for uh, if we're only interested in studying the dynamics of the system itself. But if we want to understand, well, how does like this notion of classicality, how does it emerge? We have to think a little bit more about what's happening to the environment itself. And that while in decoherence, we trace out the environment degrees of freedom, that's not what really happens. And so I recapitulate the same, the same basic example, how we see anything. Uh, we don't actually infer or we don't directly measure any system right? normally. I mean, if we're looking at screens or we're reading something, we, we're intercepting these, the, this portion of the photon environment that is scattered off it. So really, the, the environment is never 
is, is never really a, a passive player in, in this role. It's actually, it's the communication channel. So whenever it is the guy that interacts with the system and then it carries the relevant information over. And so it's this idea of, of the, the information that the, that the environment can carry over to, to the observers. That's how we define a notion of, of, of objectivity. That's where this, this idea of objectivity comes from. And so it's, it's clear then that the, the underlying sort of framework is from this information theoretic approach. And it means that at least when first formulated, the mutual information is the key quantity. So what the mutual information captures is if I have two systems, it's the information I can learn about one system by interrogating the other one. That's exactly the, 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 the sort of essence of the idea here. If my system is interacting with an environment and the environment is the communication channel, then by if I have only have access to the environment that's interacted with the system, the only information about the system that I can possibly get is the mutual information that is being shared. Now, for redundancy, for objectivity, the idea is that it shouldn't matter what portion of the environment I capture versus what portion of the environment you capture. If we agree on the state of the system, we should share the same information. And this is where the idea of the redundancy plateau comes in, that if I get, get a capture one fragment and you capture a separate fragment, if we share the same, if this, if this information that we have access to is the same, we should agree on the state of the system. And so we, in this sense, we say the state is, is, is objective. And um, what we'll see is that this arises from the, like a sort of very generic de like standard decohering dynamics. And so whenever the systems are a system through its interaction with, with the environment is driven to into, into the pointer states, so into, into, and it decoheres into these states, these are exactly the states that are able to proliferate this information redundantly across all of the environmental degrees of freedom. And that's where this idea of Darwinism comes in, the, the survival of the fittest information. It's these relevant degrees of freedom that are this relevant information that's able to proliferate into, the, into the, all of the different fragments of the environment. So yeah, uh, I skip over this. So the picture that you that you you should have when you think about this this framework is is this idea here, and this is exactly what we're well, like all of my my recent work has has been looking at the exact same basic basic setup. We have some system A that we're interested in, and then we have it interacting with some environment. And the environment, we, we fragment it. So we break it up into little bits that in principle, an observer can have access to one part of it or could have access to multiple fragments of it. But it's a fragmented environment. This guy interacts with the system and we're interested in what can we learn about the system by only interrogating these fragments. And so what we get is this, this is this red curve. This is the redundancy plateau that I, that I was talking about. So we'll see, and as, as Michael was talking about this, this sort of little tolerance where there may be some minimal fragment size that you need. Um, but then at some point, no matter how much more of the environment I have access to, I can't learn any more information. I saturate at the value of the, the information that the system that's available for the system. Now we're going to see that this happens in a in like the, this pure decoherent dynamics, but there is there is another uh, another way that the mutual information can go. Um, and that is whenever you don't see this redundancy, whenever any observers wouldn't uh, agree on an, uh, on an objective state of the system, and that's where you get this green curve, which is essentially called an encoding behavior. The essence here is that me as an observer, if I have access to a small fragment of the, of the environment, it has, it doesn't, there's no very little information about the state of the system I can get gain. And even if I get half of the environment, if I get access to B1, 2, 3, and 4, I still don't really learn very much about the system. It's not until I have more, or at least over half the environment, that I then suddenly learn virtually all of the information that is available between both the system and, and, the, and these fragments. So this is a, a very different behavior where there's, it's clear there's no redundancy here. Now. I want to digress for five minutes and just introduce the basic the basic uh, features of of collision models, which if you're not familiar with, collision models are just a wonderfully simple way of studying an open system dynamics, um, which and you know it relies on just the most basic ingredients that we cover in our in our you know introductory quantum mechanics courses. So you can go back to these papers in around about sort of to early two thousands, um, where they introduced. The, the, well, 
it turns out they reintroduced the basic framework of, of collision models. And it's very simple. <clears throat> Imagine I have a, a system and I want to model its open system dynamics. I can go through the, let's say, the normal approach where I can write down what my, what my environment is, do the unitary evolution, trace out the environmental degrees of freedom, and then get my, my dynamical equation. Or what we do in a collision model is say, well, imagine my environment is broken up into a whole bunch of individual identical little copies. So for the purposes here, let's say everything is a qubit and all of these guys are in thermal states. Okay, so they're, and they're all in the exact same thermal state of a qubit. If I want to model the dynamics of the system, so uh, uh, a, a sort of standard thermalizing dynamics, I can imagine a situation where the system collides with one of the, the environmental qubits. So a, just a two qubit unitary interaction for a short period. After that's done, this guy gets thrown away, system moves on, interacts with a new guy. You can sort of imagine it like a conveyor belt of identical copies of a, of a thermal state that the system interacts with a little bit. If that interaction is something like a partial swap operation, what happens is that the system will, every interaction, the system gets closer and closer to this thermal state. So, and you can formally show you get exactly the same uh, GKSL type dynamics from this kind of collisional, this discretized collisional picture um, as you do from, yeah, yeah, from the standard master equation. So this, this is nice. What I like here is that it's a very minimal setup that recovers a, a very, well, we can, we can write down a very standard open system dynamics that we'd be interested in, but it gives a huge amount of, of uh, tunability. So you see, what, I'm, what I was considering there for this thermalization dynamics was something like a simple partial swap or an exchange interaction. But this is a two qubit unitary. I can write down whatever I want for it. So I have tunability here to explore a slightly different dynamics of the system interacting with, let's say, a whole bunch of thermal, thermal states um, and seeing what happens in the dynamics if I change this interaction. And you know, there's formalisms and tools that allow us to, get to sometimes write down closed master equations that arise from this dynamics. But even then, beyond that, we can still just play about with it even numerically and see, see what happens. As an aside, um, I mean, the tunability kind of goes beyond just the system, but also into the environment. Again, you have kind of have uh, in this very minimal picture where system collides with one guy and then you throw him away and it interacts with a new guy, you kind of have a Markov approximation baked in there. There's a sort of forgetfulness sort of implicit. Um, you can tune this to introduce non-Markovianity by introducing additional interactions or by adding in um, co pre-existing correlations. There's a huge amount of things. I think the point I want to make here is just that they're a very versatile tool for exploring generic open system dynamics. And so you can read these papers from, from around 2000 and onwards to sort of see what, what has been done. Um, but really, uh, it's an amazing paper from the 60s. So Jacitha Rao, actually, she basically outlined all of this, this formalism 40 years before anyone, anyone sort of started really thinking seriously about it. So if you go back, it's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful paper that lays out all of the stuff, does almost exactly the same sort of style, and it's written in very much so the kind of open systems language that, that, we, um, that we would use today, but just without explicitly saying it. So I mean, it's a paper that was really decades, decades ahead of its time, I think. So. And so then, if you go into the literature at all, anywhere, um, a little bit of noise in the background. I don't know. Um, so if you know, if you go into the literature a little bit, um, you'll see that collision collision models pop up everywhere. So this is just a very tiny um, snapshot of a couple a couple of papers that um, you'll you'll find that recently collision models have been used in to to explore a few different. Um, a few different open system questions, but even beyond that, things like uh, quantum memories and quantum refrigerators and everything. So if you're interested um, on just a little bit more on the collision model framework, we wrote a, a, a short little uh, perspective paper for EPL this year. So this is nice, simple nighttime reading. Seven pages gives you a very gentle introduction to the basics of collision models. Um, but for a the for the proper, I'd say canonical resource has been has been written. Um, so from Francesco and friends. 
that came out a couple of a couple of months ago now. This is really an excellent pedagogical introduction. It covers everything you could want to know from the the basic formalism of collision models all the way up into like the most recent applications. So, if you're interested in, in knowing a little bit more generally about collision models, just take a look in in some of these papers. Okay. Let's get back to the to the Darwinism thing. So hopefully that small digression on collision models has convinced you enough that the basic ingredients there um, are kind of tailor built for exploring uh, for, or for for testing this this Darwinism idea. I mean, the fact is that in a collision model, you fragment the environment from the outset. So it's, it's sort of naturally baked in and it gives us this tunability as well. If we view things as a collision model, then like being able to, to, if we really take it as reductive as possible and we have just like two body interactions between the system and an environmental qubit say, which is what I'll consider, but like an entire an environmental fragment, we can see what, what role those, those interactions have. So the small variation that I make on the collision model for the purposes of, of studying Darwinism is to normally we would have considered the system to collide with a guy and then we would get rid of it and the system would never see that, that fragment again. For the purposes of what we're going to do, we're going to make this, the, the environment finite size and we'll allow the system to repeatedly interact with a, a given fragment. So everything I'm going to be talking about is going to be qubits, but I, I don't think that's that's a particularly stringent uh, restriction. So what we'll what we'll have, and I guess what what I've looked at in these couple of papers, I'll focus on these these two, where essentially we take the it's basically it is actually a spin star kind of configuration um, through the guys. I mean, we thought about it initially in in the let's say within the framework of collision models, where the central the system is is our guy of interest. It's going to start in some coherent state. And then we're going to initialize all of the environmental fragments, all of these qubits in some, uh, generally, I think we take everything to be something like a plus state, but everyone is factorized initially. And we just tune away. We have a bit of a play about with this interaction term where we allow the system to randomly choose one of these qubits to interact with. And it'll interact for a short period of time. It'll have a small collision. And then it'll randomly pick another guy to interact with, randomly pick another one to interact with, maybe go back to the first guy and we'll do that. We'll just randomly choose uh, environmental qubits to interact with and see how the role of the interaction term changes. Nothing too surprising I am going to tell you about in, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the initial part of this. The extension that I think gets more interesting that I'll hopefully spend the last sort of five or 10 minutes or last 10 minutes or so on will be whenever we take a, a what I would say a seemingly natural but kind of obvious extension and say, well, what happens if my system itself isn't just a a single qubit or a single like a, a single guy, but there it's a composite system. And so this we we consider what happens when we allow for potentially some interactions, but otherwise we'll keep everything else the same. But basically this sort of spin spin star like picture and see what happens here. And an interesting thing emerges that you know there's a bit of a competition between whether or not the state you would consider the state classical uh or and objective it, it looks like you can have an objective state without it necessarily being classical okay so let me talk a little bit about this um very very simple setup so this is essentially the the well it's the, it's exactly the same the same model that that michael was showing in his early slides <clears throat> where he had that 200 qubit environment the symmetric spin model this is you know, i call it the spin star here when we look at it in this collision model picture what we have here is we plot a bunch of uh, a bunch of these mutual information um, curves. So we calculate the mutual information between the system and a fragment of the environment. So one qubit with two qubits with three qubits with four qubits. Um, and we go up to, I think it goes from six qubit environment up to a nine qubit environment, say here. So, but we have this kind of random picture. System collides with one guy and then interacts with another one, interacts with another one. And we do this sufficient number of times um, if it's a uniform distribution, the system will eventually interact with everyone roughly the same number of times. So it'll have about the same number of collisions with everyone. Um, and then if we look at the dynamics across it, if we, we'll find that, uh, tie, that there is a, a point in the, uh, on average where we'll see this redundancy plateau emerging whenever we take this simple dephasing interaction term. So whenever this is just a pure dephasing interaction, and again, this is not that surprising at all. I mean, this was already very well known in the literature that these pure decoherence dynamics are exactly the types of interactions that we need in order to build up the right sort of state 
which is what we get here. It's again, exactly the state that the, the Michael was showing um, that it builds up this big GHZ state between the pointer states of the system and basically these sort of phase flipped states of the environment. So we see the, 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 the perfect fl redundancy plateau here. But collision models, this is where we were, we were more interested in saying, well, okay, we know that this, we knew this was going to happen for pure de decoherence. What happens if I change the nature of the interaction? So what happens if my system is randomly, is colliding, but instead of just pure dephasing, we have something like an exchange interaction. Again, a very normal, natural interaction to consider. So here now, exact same setting, but we have this exchange interaction. And what we find is we get this kind of almost linear behavior. In fact, if we vary this interaction strength, we, we tune the parameters, we can get this curve to look very like that encoding um, behavior that we saw, we saw early on. So what this means is that essentially, the again, maybe not such a surprising conclusion, the nature of the interaction plays a, a very strong role in whether or not we see this, the, the characteristic features of this, this um, uh, classical objectivity emerging. So what you have is this pure dephasing, pure decoherence, where there's no energy exchange, there's only information exchange, gives you exactly the conditions you need. While something like an energy exchange interaction, or yeah, these exchange interactions where energy or yeah, where excitations and, and, and information is being exchanged has a tendency to lose um, objectivity. Now, a question that uh, I was a little interested in was, okay, I know for, 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 so we know we get Darwinism when we take this pure dephasing dynamics, this pure decoherence dynamics. And that's very nice because we can analytically solve the model. We don't really need to rely on this collisional model picture anymore. Um, so then we can say, well, okay, well, what happens if I look at the, be the behavior of the system interacting with, with this environment? Um, what, what sort of features of the system and the environment emerge whenever I see redundancy, whenever I see the, the decoherent or the, the Darwinism emerging? So what I'm looking at here, this N is the number of times the system has collided with each of the environmental qubits. So because of the nature of this interaction, I can kind of abandon that random picture because everything commutes, I can do everything at once. I can have the system essentially pulsing, interacting with, with its environment. And if I look at a small environment for six qubits, what does Darwinism say? It tells us that I'll have, it, it posits that I have classical objectivity when the mutual information, which is this black curve, is equal to the entropy of the system. When this happens, then this is normally a, the, the indicative of me having classical objectivity. So I look at this quantity for just system with one environmental fragment. So they're really the extreme version of, of, of objectivity where as an observer, I would only need to capture a single qubit from the environment to have all of the relevant information. So what we look at is this blue curve, I think, is where things are, things are more interesting. So this is the coherence of the system. I started in some sort of plus state. I let it, I let it interact for all of these, these collisions. And then at some point, it's become completely classical. It's fully dephased. And you see for this small environment, this is roughly about the same point as whenever you see the, the mutual information equal to the, to the system entropy. So we have that you know, decohered system corresponding to the, to the at least signatures of the emergence of classicality here. But if we scale up the size of the environment now, if we go up to like a hundred qubit environment, well, what you see is that the system is now inter it's pulsing with a huge amount, much, much more degrees of freedom of the environment. So it decoheres really quickly. So it'll lose all of its coherence very early in the dynamics. But what you, if you look at the mutual information that it shares with any single fragment of the environment, it's very small. So you, um, you're, you're very far away from, from the, the entropy of the system. You need to wait much, much longer. And in fact, the crucial part for whenever you're looking at just a single qubit of the environment to be able to gain all of the information, you have to wait until there's like a strong decoherence, a mutual decoherence essentially between the system and the environment before it has enough, info, it, it, it can get, or before it has got all of the information, the relevant information about the system. So this kind of indicates that, you know, the, the decoherence of the system itself is, is not enough. Um, and I think then this, this all ties very closely in with, with the, the Chernoff idea, the Chernoff bounds that, that Michael was talking about. Because the criticism here, or let's say the, the point you will make is, yeah, but fine, Steve, you're, you're talking about a single qubit out of a larger environment. So 
if I scale up the fragment size here, which is exactly what, what we see here, if I go with something like, um, yeah, 15 collisions, that's this point here where the system has fully decohered with, uh, it's got no coherences left. A single qubit of the environment, I get very little information. I certainly do not have objectivity at this level. Uh, the mutual information is too low. But if I take a large enough fragment, which is here, which is to say around about 10%, then I, I, I reach the, the plateau. And then for every larger fragment I get, uh, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I, I can learn no more. So there's this kind of trade-off between the two. There's a, a need to decohere the, 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 well, the interaction, to, to mutually defase the, the environmental degrees of freedom, but there's a bit of a trade-off between how much you need to do depending on the fragment size you have. So again, this is, a lot of this is very closely related with, with um, what, what Michael was talking about in some of those, those earlier papers. I think this one in particular, um, that scientific reports. But okay, for the last 10 minutes, um, I move on to the more recent things, which is just a very simple extension of that basic model. So what, I, what we had or what we established from that collision model picture um, is that central system, call it a qubit, interacting with a spin bath um, through this collision model. If, it's inter if the interaction is the pure defeat, the standard pure decohering dynamics, we have all of the conditions necessary. We're almost guaranteed that we'll see um, signatures of classical objectivity, at least following the, the Darwinism paradigm. If you change that interaction term, you lose those signatures. So it seems like then, you know, uh, that if you do something like an exchange interaction, that that is broken. So what we said is, okay, well, let's, let's go with the picture where we know we get classical objectivity for a single system. So let's keep this, the, these guys interacting with the environment through that same dephasing like interaction. But now I have two qubits that make up my system. So I, and I allow them in principle to have some interaction, but I need to keep, I keep the interaction reasonably simple. I keep this guy as a, as a excitation preserving interaction. But otherwise, all of the all of the rules are the same. I take these two coherent initial states for simplicity. We'll take them to be the same, uh, and I initialize all of my environments in in the plus state again. So, if this were just a single qubit, I would have exactly the the, the Darwinism picture we saw. But now I have this additional interaction term. The question is, how does this complicate things? And if you've studied this sort of model at all, you'll probably see where I'm going. But you can. Because of the nature of this interaction uh, and the fact that this is energy pre or excitation preserving, again, everything is simple. We don't really need to rely on the collision model picture anymore. Um, we can instead like just work on it in a sort of continuous time limit. And what we find is that you can write down exactly what the what the the global state of this of the composite system and the environmental qubits are. And what you find is that you basically get this. Um, splitting in the in the space. So you'll see exactly the same state that we had from the single qubit case appearing in the, the zero, zero and one, one states. You see the these populations are left unaffected, essentially, and the, the environmental qubits, they all pick up this kind of equal and opposite phase behavior. So they, there's the, the telltale encoding behavior is going on here. But we obviously, I mean, it's a two qubit system. We have an additional uh, set of degrees of freedom where this is a decoherence free subspace. So you see that there's no, essentially these environmental qubits are completely blind to, to the presence of this, of this interaction term, which is doing something. It's sloshing excitations back and forth. And this has a very interesting uh, knock on effect whenever we start thinking about classicality and, and objectivity. So we went and we, you know, we we did we just did the exact same thing. We did the same. We played the same games, calculated the same things. So we can take our two qubit system, and we can trace out our our environment and have a just have a look at what the state looks looks like. And we get it in this in this X form. So we have the populations due to the nature of the interaction with the the environment. These guys don't change too much, um, and it's these far off diagonal terms. They're the guys that get deco here. They the decay due to the interaction with the environment, while this single excitation subspace, these off diagonal elements, these guys slosh back and forth. They do something. So they, they don't get affected by the environment at all. But now we focus here. Let's just look at these red curves. 
we look at the mutual information, like the, the, the standard picture that we're interested in for, for Darwinism, and we say, OK, well, is it classically objective just according to the minimal criteria that, that Darwinism sets? So we calculate the mutual information between the composite system and different fragment sizes. So we take a six qubit environment and we say, OK, what's the mutual information between the composite system and that fragment? And you'll see that, again, there's a natural uh, point in the dynamics where you meet all of the, where these terms, these, the, the, these off diagonal terms vanish. So you get perfect decoherence on these terms. That's exactly when you get a perfect redundancy plateau, exactly at the system, at the, the entropy of the system. So you have a perfectly uh, uh, Darwinistic behavior uh, uh, being observed at the level of the composite system. But you can then, I think a natural question then is, okay, the composite system appears to be classically objective. If I look at just one of the two guys, so I trace out system, system two, and I look at just the, the mutual information shared between the system and, the, and the, the environment, do I have classical objectivity there? And it's a little bit subtle. What we find is you do get a redundancy. So there's a definite plateau that emerges, but it's much lower than the entropy of the system. So you, there's something missing here. So there's a, while the composite system, the environment seems to have access to all of, all of the relevant information. When you look at the reduced system, there's something missing. And that something missing, of course, is exactly captured within these off diagonal elements. In fact, if you calculate the quantumness of this um, reduced state of the S1, S2 state, it's what we have here in this solid orange curve. You see at this point here, which is where the composite system shows the telltale Darwinistic signatures, we have a strong amount of non-classicality. There's a sizable amount of quantum discord here. So there's something a little bit, a little bit more subtle going on. It looks like we have a classically objective state using the minimal um, uh, criteria given by Darwinism. But if we look at the state itself, it, it's definitely non-classical due to the fact that it's living in this decoherence-free sub, well, there's a decoherence-free subspace. So you may then say, okay, well, what, what about the correlation shared between the system and the environment? So we, at least the minimal thing that we can do is calculate the discord between one of these qubits, because this was the first intuition that the reason for this, this discrepancy was somehow that the system shared non-classical correlations with these environmental fragments. And so we calculated it. But at this point where we get this redundancy, or let's say this plateau, the correlation shared between S1 and any single qubit in the environment vanishes. So there's no quantum correlations between S1 or S2 and the, and the, and the environmental fragments themselves. So something, something uh, need, would need a little bit more digging into. And this is where, I mean, you have to go a little bit beyond the Darwinism, the, the uh, well, I guess you could say the traditional Darwinism framework. Uh, and you look at um, what I guess we'll hear a little bit more about from, from Derek later on, on the, the spectrum broadcasting structures. And then also this, this very, very nice recent paper by Thau and Alexandra that covered, that looked at the conditions on Darwinism um, through uh, how Darwin, let's say, how, how stringent we need to be on these conditions. And what they established was that this mutual information, it captures the total correlations that are available. So you might say, well, actually, there could be a sizable amount of quantum correlations captured in that mutual information that really you need to put an additional constraint on top of it that this mutual information is purely classical. And so maybe what we were wondering is perhaps if we test the strong Darwinism framework, we'll understand, we'll say that actually this is a false flag. That's what we were, that's what we were, we were looking to test. But there is, and in my last few minutes, there is a, a subtlety with Darwin or with, with quantum discord. So the conditions that Thau and Alexandra uh, outlined was at the level of this mutual information, you have to say, well, actually that mutual information is completely classical. So if I calculate the discord shared between the system and the, and the environmental fragment, that should be zero. Now, what they considered in this paper, if I remember correctly, was calculating the discord in terms of measurements on the system. But quantum discord is a curious beast. It's an asymmetric quantity. I can have quanta, a different value depending on which of the systems I ask. And this then leads to a, a, a subtlety where we go back and think about, well, what's the original motivation, the original paradigm of, of, um, of Darwinism? And what Zurich was suggesting was that the environment is the information carriers. 
So it is the we 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 should talk, we should talk about what information can we learn by interrogating the fragments themselves. So really, what we said was okay. Well, what happens if we look at the Discord whenever we do measurements on the environment? fragment rather than on the system. So the kind of the opposite version of what, what the guys thought about in this paper. And then it's very easy to see. I mean, you can work out a necessary and sufficient condition for our very simplistic picture where our state, our two qubit state with the, with the overall state of the environment is one of these quantum classical states. If I do measurements on the system, I have non-zero correlations between the, this composite system and the environmental fragment. But from the other direction, if I do measurements only on the on the environment, uh, I have zero discord. So there's two perspectives here. From the environment's perspective, the system is fully classical and completely objective. But from the from the system's perspective, it's definitely non-classical. But maybe it's objective. Now I think we're going to hear more about the, this idea um, in Akram's talk in a little while. So I'll I'll, I'll leave it there. And so I think in my last 20 seconds, I'll just give you the takeaway messages, which is I think the spin star collision model picture gave us a nice way to sort of tune the knob and see how the interactions affect things. And what we find is that, yes, pure decohering dynamics definitely give us the conditions that we see classical objectivity and um, tuning it to other interactions, even like sort of well physically motivated ones. There seems to be a bit of a subtlety there. Um, so I think there's a bit more info, a bit more stuff needs to go in uh, study there. I'm very interested in this idea of the composite systems, the, this sort of slight dichotomy apparently between classicality and objectivity. So you can read more about this in, in exactly in the, the classical spam that uh, my, Michael was talking about. So it's one of the papers in this, in this special issue that we just submitted to. And if you take nothing else away from this talk, it's that collision models are just great crack to work with. So if you're interested in open systems, um, have, have a go with them. I will quickly thank my collaborators. So Barish, Osgur, Maro, and, and Bassano. Um, really, Barish did like the lion's share of the work on all of this, and I will stop there. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are some. Uh, thank you, Steve, for your talk. Yeah. So, does anyone want to ask any questions? No. Akram, do you want to go first? Hello. Uh, hi, Steve. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just, just, just have a quick question on, on the mutual information plot you showed where, where you have both subsystems S1 and S2. So it's understandable that when, when you look at the mutual information between S1 and fragments of the environment, it's not symmetric. So the, 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 uh, because you don't, have, you don't have a pure state if you consider system plus the whole environment, but is that plateau exactly equal? I assume that should be the case to the von Neumann entropy of S1. That's the idea there, right? Uh, yeah. So we well, we we calculate. Um, so yeah, it's it's not quite so clear probably here. This yeah, yeah. mutual information is rescaled with the entropy of S1. So what you would expect is that this should plateau at one if if S if S1 is classically objective, but it's far below. So the, these these two curves are rescaled with the in some sense the correct von Neumann entropy for the system we're looking at. So this upper one is rescaled with respect to the entropy of S1, S2, and this okay. one is rescaled with the entropy of S1, and you still have this this big discrepancy. And in fact, that discrepancy comes from it's actually just the complementary mutual information that S2 is sharing with the with the I think the complementary fragment. Yeah. And, and the discord you're mentioning there is just measuring. So the discord, the, the green plot on the on the side is just measuring S1, right? Yeah, this is just for S1. This was a kind of precursor calculation we did where we were like, okay, well, what if we look at this this discord? Um, because we couldn't calculate the S1, S2 and the and an environmental fragment initially. So we just looked at the actual quantitative value and then we found this necessary and sufficient condition. So um, oh, okay. we, we tried actually, well, one of the things we tried to do here um, was digging into these like Koashi Winter relations to see if we could understand a little bit more of these, the, these the discrepancies. We have some, there's some results on this in the, in the supplementary or in the appendices of the paper, but it's not all that insightful yet, or at least I, I couldn't see the, the big takeaway message. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, then now, Yarek, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, so I have um, more than a question. I have a comment. It's uh, 
very funny thing, these composite systems, we studied them in some detail about three or four years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but in much simpler version where we didn't study the interactions within the within the central system. So we just took what we call the uh, spin register. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, on the level of spectrum broadcast structure, so on the level of, uh, of states, there are quite some funny things happening. I don't know, maybe they will correspond which, which, with what you have been mm -hmm. uh, trying to understand here. Well, if there is DFS, so if there is uh, the coherence-free subspace accompanied by, by some RF structure, which we call the orthogonalization-free um, subspace, but it doesn't matter. But generally what happens is that in the presence of DFS, the um, uh, structure of objectivity gets some sort of a coarse graining. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the uh, system environment interaction is uh, not able to resolve individual states within DFS. That's obvious. That's more or less the definition of DFS. Mm -hmm. However, what gets uh, broadcasted to environment is uh, the whole, so to say, index of DFS. Mm -hmm. So what you can what you can imagine is that you have uh, that you have an information that you have let's say several DFSs you have um, rich enough structure of your of your central system that allows for for a uh, several decoherence free subspaces then what we uh, have seen and it's actually quite a nice <clears throat> quite a nice object is that the information about DFS is being broadcasted to the environment, but environment is not able to resolve in which exactly state within DFS the system is. Uh -huh. We called it a uh, coarse grained, uh, coarse grained spectrum broadcast structure. So, in a sense, what you uh, what you wrote somewhere at the at the very end, so that from the uh, environment point of view. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is objectivity and classicality, but yeah, exactly. But from the system's perspective, it's non-classical. I would totally agree with that mm -hmm. because I I have classicality, but I have or I have objectivity, but the higher level, not at the level of individual pointer states, but at the level of individual pointer subspaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, however, within those pointer subspaces, I can have whatever, of course, superposition I, I want. And this is the non-classical non -classical part uh, from the, let's say, systems perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There can be even more, uh, more weird situations, which we, we have a working title for the, the truth problem, where you can get um, a distinguishability of, uh, of the environmental states, which gives you basically a sort of an illusion of full information. Mm -hmm. But this distinguishability is not accompanied by decoherence. Mm -hmm. And this is a very weird, uh, weird object that, that can also appear in, in, in composite systems. Mm -hmm. So even, even if you don't, even if you go like very, very simple, like, like, like we did, I think it was 2017, maybe 16. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you go like, you know, very simple and you don't, don't consider the, the interactions between the, the mm. constituents of the central system, you can still get a oh, yeah. lot of very Actually, fun yeah, effects. I guess that, yeah. Um, yeah, so the talk time has kind of ended, so I oh, think sorry. everyone can take a break, sure. but you can continue chatting because we're going to leave the Zoom meeting up, obviously, right? Let me, so, let me stop the share. Yeah, so... Um, um, Thank you, Steve, for the talk. And Yarek and Steve, you can continue talking. I think um, sure. my co-host is going to make like breakout rooms in the Zoom. So you can join one of these breakout rooms to continue discussing. Yeah.